this is a special edition of Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the premier financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Now, for this special edition of Macro Voices, here's hedge fund manager Eric Townsend. Macro Voices All Stars Episode 88 was recorded on January 13th, 2020. I'm Eric Townsend. Back with us in the new year, it is Jeffrey Snyder, CIO of Alhambra Investments. And as usual, Jeff has prepared a terrific slide deck to accompany today's interview. The slide deck download link is in the description of today's episode on our homepage at macrovoices.com. This episode of Macro Voices All Stars is brought to you by TopTradersUnplugged.com, the leading podcast when it comes to quant and rules based investing. I'll tell you how to claim a free copy of their new guide to the best investing books ever written at the end of this episode. Jeff, when we first saw this repo situation blow up, we were assured, look, this is transitory, it's temporary, it's just a tiny little end of quarter thing, it's, it's nothing to worry about. There's going to be a little intervention, but it's a one-time deal. No worries, nothing to see here, move along. It's starting to look like the Fed's repo interventions are going to be around a little bit longer than was first communicated. It's maybe not going to be that one-time thing. So this asset purchase plan, which we're definitely not supposed to call QE, which raises the level of bank reserves, plus a temporary standby repo window to dole out additional reserves just in case the situation should arise, even though there's no problem here. It's just like any other quarter end, or we're supposed to think that. Now they're saying that those programs could go on for several months, if not indefinitely. So it seems somehow that the original description of what was wrong wasn't right, but they haven't really given uh, an alternate version. So according to Fed officials, none of this really matters to the regular guy on the street. It's a bunch of technical matters. The best and the brightest monetary minds already have it completely under control. There's nothing to see here. Move along. Don't look under the covers, and whatever you do, don't call it QE. Why is it, Jeff, that I kind of get the feeling that you might have a different take on this? Well, (laughs) because we're both reasonably intelligent people capable of observing things and applying common sense. Um, I mean, look, this is so much bigger than just a minor calendar problem in the repo market. What the Fed is trying to avoid coming to grips with is the systemic monetary issue you and I have been talking about the entire time I've been interviewing with you. It continues to plague the global system 12 and a half years after it first showed up. And, you know, it's our listeners who have to bear the cost of this continuing stupidity. And those costs are enormous, but they remain very well hidden by this array of, you know, excuses and technical jargon. Well, let's let's play devil's advocate here, because judging by the unemployment rate, the economy's doing pretty well. I mean, you know, look at what the Fed's official mandate is. It's to, to manage the rate of unemployment. So it says, or at least Jay Powell claims that it says, that he has done his job very successfully in finishing up what was left to him by his predecessors, Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen. And sure enough, we really do have, at least as measured by government numbers, a huge improvement in the unemployment rate. Yeah, and the unemployment rate is always cited as evidence of economic strength, but it's not actually all that straightforward as it is made out to be. I mean, you know, go to slide three, and that's where we'll start. We heard from the middle of last year onward that this is now the longest expansion on record. You know, Donald Trump won his election in large part by complaining about the unemployment rate, only to now turn around and fully embrace it. The unemployment rate is one of those easy to understand numbers that we are all taught to believe it must be pretty accurate. And up until the last 10 years or so, it was. The unemployment rate aligned closely enough with other economic accounts so that it didn't require any skepticism on our part. Now, the mainstream view of the economy starting out in 2020 is what you see on slide four. This is the longest expansion on record. We're already half a year longer than the previous one, assuming GDP didn't fall off a cliff in the fourth quarter, which it probably didn't. So real GDP is at record highs, and they like to say record high because it sounds very good. And in this case, also because it's technically true, there hasn't been a declared recession, at least in the U.S., since 2009. But we live in a nonlinear world, which means that what actually matters isn't the absolute difference between a plus sign or a minus sign attached to real GDP. What actually makes all the difference in the world is the rate of change. 
Okay, hang on a second, Jeff, because when you say a nonlinear world, th that sounds like a really cool buzzword. But what specifically do you mean by that phrase? Well, if economic growth is established at a long run average of, say, around 5%, that's actually the dividing line, not zero. If growth accelerates to, say, 10%, for example, people will notice the difference between 10% and 5% because 5% was what they had become accustomed to. That's what's normal to them. And if economic growth drops to, say, let's say 2% from that 5% baseline, that's actually a contraction. Even though growth is still positive, it isn't the same thing at all. There's a material difference. And in every way, it feels and acts like a contraction, especially if it's sustained for a prolonged period of time. Now, here's the thing. All we need to do is draw one simple dotted line, and suddenly record high GDP looks very, very different. So if you go to slide five, what you see is that the rate of change changed right around 2008. And it's been this latter period where the rate of change is significantly less. That's where the Fed suddenly becomes active, right? I mean, before 2008, or at least for a quarter century before the crisis, all the central bank did was move around the Fed funds rate. They didn't get involved in all this fancy footwork with monetary policy. But all of a sudden, a global financial crisis, a different rate of change in the economy, and included with those a central bank that even 10 years later can't seem to stop doing QEs. We, we've learned that we're not allowed to call them QE anymore, but they're really still doing the same thing. They're tinkering with bank reserves because simply adjusting the Fed funds rate isn't enough to achieve their objectives. Yeah, and that, that's exactly what we see on slide six. So we already have two clues to follow up on. The rate of change changed during the same period when the Fed's operations changed. Both of those were, at least until now, they have become permanent. But if you ask Jay Powell, what he would tell you is, is that, you know, this is just how it is. When we look at the huge gap between the previous rate of change and the new one, the old baseline represented by the dash line or what I've shown you here on slide six and the current rate of change where growth is at best 2%, we have to look at it one of two ways. Now, the first way to look at it is on slide seven and slide eight. This is the official view. This is the one that says the longest expansion on record. It is the booming economy of the unemployment rate. The rate of change did change but the economy couldn't possibly have performed any better. It is what economists and central bankers refer to as R star or the, you know, the natural rate of interest. That's what R star is. It's called the natural rate of interest. And it's also where they start to lose anyone in the public who might be curious enough to actually start thinking about and in, in looking at the differences between quote unquote record high GDP and where GDP might have been along our dotted line. The natural rate of interest or R star is something you know, that economists calculate as being determined by supply side factors or what's called economic potential. So if the rate of change is so much less than it used to be, and it clearly is, the Fed says that's because economic potential changed sometime after 2008. Now, what low R star means is a couple of things. One is productivity that economists can't explain, and lower productivity that economists can't explain. And the other big one is what they say is an aging and lazy labor force. Baby boomers are retiring in huge numbers and younger Americans who are either you know, addicted to opioids or unmotivated to go back to college and learn to code. And it's a labor force that has become so rigid and of such diminishing value that the economy can no longer grow like it once did. According to them, these are structural factors that, that are outside the scope of monetary policy. So the Fed can claim it ultimately can't address these problems, but they'll still try with unconventional policies like these QEs to try to lessen their impact on the economy. That's the official view. What's the alternative view? Well, the alternative view is the one with all the evidence, and that's the one that's consistent with common sense. And it, you know, it's a really pretty straightforward, simple choice. If you go to slide nine, Either you believe the economy can't grow like it once did, that baby boomers and drug addicts all got together in 2008 and sabotaged economic potential, or you believe that there must be something holding it back, that this new lower rate of change since 2007 is kept artificially low by factors officials don't seem to want to ever consider. Okay, Jeff. So what you're saying is that the impaired labor market isn't the actual cause of lower economic potential, but instead an effect or a symptom of a bigger underlying problem. There's room for more job growth despite the unemployment rate being at a 50-year low. Is that right? Yeah. And the word is slack. If you go to slide 10, 
if the economy can't grow like it used to, the unemployment rate or our star view of the economy is the correct one. However, if there is any slack, and we're talking you know, 10, maybe 15 million potential American workers, then something big obviously must be wrong. And the real tragedy here is that the bond market has been telling you and everyone, everyone else what's been wrong the entire time. If you go to slide 11 here, in 1967, Milton Friedman pointed this out. You know, that's how old this problem has become. He said that low interest rates are not a sign of loose monetary policy. They're instead a sign that money has become tight. This was one of the biggest mistakes that was made in the 1930s, why the Great Depression was first so catastrophic, and second, why it just went on and on and on. Interest rates were low throughout that decade in the 1930s, which said that money became and then remained tight. Growth and recovery were enormously constrained by what, you know, exactly what low treasury yields had indicated. But also notice that you know, something else in what he said. If you go to slide 12, I've highlighted it. The money supply can be tight even when it is growing. Again, rate of change. If the economy requires hypothetically 10% monetary growth and the system only supplies 5% monetary growth, that's still tight money. And it will result in lower and lower interest rates, as well as probably a lot of confusion among officials who don't ever heed this fallacy. Okay, hang on a second, because you're quoting Milton Friedman, who's not only a super famous guy, but he was one of Ben Bernanke's favorite people to quote. I remember Bernanke quoting Friedman about helicopter money, for for example. So surely, if Friedman was pointing this stuff out in 1967, then central bankers by 2007, including Ben Bernanke, who frequently referred to and quoted Milton Friedman, had to be well aware of that view. Yeah, here's the thing, though. Central bankers are obviously aware of of Friedman's warning on interest rates as well as a lot of other monetary factors, sure. But they've also complicated them with with what they always like to do with these things, which is they take something that's pretty simple and straightforward, even intuitive, and they rearrange it so that they can fit into their neo-Keynesian econometric framework. Slide 13, just like you were talking about, Eric. In 2003, Ben Bernanke, again, Building upon Milton Friedman's point, he point blank said, you can't judge how tight or loose monetary policy is being by the short term interest rate alone or any interest rate. So, you know, for their view on this, it begins in blindness, as we'll get to later. What I mean by that is is for modern central bankers, they judge monetary policy by how the short term rate compares to the neutral interest rate, which is in part derived from the natural interest rate, meaning our, our star. So they think that if the monetary policy rate is below the neutral rate, whatever they determine the neutral rate to be, no matter where in absolute terms that might be, monetary policy is in their view loose. So even if the short-term rate is, say, you know, 10%, double digits, if they decide the neutral rate is something like 12%, then in this view, monetary policy is being loose. Jeff, that seems to me to put a huge amount of emphasis and pressure on calculating our star first. And then once you've got our star, you have to hope that you've got that right so that you can then use that figure and and possibly figure out what the neutral interest rate is. Neither of these is observable. So so you're always talking a matter of opinion, correct? I mean, this is economists that basically sit at their computers putting models together. Nobody can can go out and measure what our star is at a given moment in time. Yeah, and it's that, Eric. It's worse than that, you know, because the, the the processes and equations they use are very complex, and they're also very elegant and beautiful in terms of mathematics. But they're nowhere actually complex enough. Certainly not enough to accurately assess economic factors, so as to more closely estimate the you know what's really going on in the world. But you know, no matter the formulas and practices, we have real world testing of all these theories at our fingertips. Let's start. We go to slide fourteen. You can see by the orange dotted line what the mainstream view of economic potential had been just before the crisis hit. Now, here and going forward, I'm going to use the CBO's numbers because, you know, they aren't any different from any of the other econometric models, including those used by the Fed. So what all the models said before, you know, in January 2007 was that economic potential over the long run would be consistent. That's why the dotted line just keeps going up unbroken, that the rate of change that had existed before would continue into the long run. Nobody thought that was going to change before the crisis hit. And even after the Great Recession, a recession you know, implies something very specific too. We have to keep that in mind. A recession is only a temporary deviation in output. It does not alter or is not supposed to alter economic potential. Output is curtailed. You know, GDP falls and often significantly. But then a recovery happens, which was supposed to bring us right back up to the same potential, as you'll see on slide 15. 
Now, I've included the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield here for a specific purpose, and it's the one that was raised by Friedman in his interest rate fallacy. We can use it to tell us something important about monetary conditions. Remember, low interest rates, especially falling interest rates, are a sign of tight money. And that's, you know, that's what we need to be precise about. Not just low interest rates, but falling interest rates. Again, the rate of change. So as the financial crisis created the Great Recession, you know, sure enough, Treasury yields fell pretty sharply, even as the Fed used up all its tricks, creating largely irrelevant bank reserves. Jeff, I can see on your next chart that the CBO redraws economic potential during the Great Recession. As you said, that's not what's supposed to happen when a recession hits, even a severe one. Yeah, if you go to slide 16, even by January 2009, their models were picking up on the idea that maybe this recovery would be different. At that time, our star wasn't really developed, and it wouldn't really be until you know much later, around 2015, 2016, as we'll, as we'll get into a little bit further along. Instead, by 2010, the recovery started to get pushed back as other things kept going on. Go to slide 17. Treasury yields, for example, wouldn't normalize. And then there was a second QE in the U.S. for reasons Ben Bernanke never ever adequately explained. Clearly, there was something still, you know, there was something going wrong even at that early point in the recovery. And sure enough, a, a second global liquidity crisis struck in 2011, including at one point, and, you know, I'm not making this up. It's in the FOMC transcripts for that year. Authorities in 2011, in August 2011, first discussed what would have amounted to a bailout of the repo market in much the same way they're doing or trying to do right now. The result of that second liquidity crisis was, in the economy anyway, the, the, the impacts on the economy, as you can see in slide 18, they were pretty clear. Not only did Treasury yields fall again, signaling tight money, the economy nearly experienced, the U.S. economy nearly experienced a recession in the back half of 2012. But because it didn't get all the way to one, the whole thing was largely ignored, especially over time. In fact, you know, Bernanke was again patted on the back for what everyone said was QE3 and QE4, keeping the economy from experiencing a full recession like the one that Europe did. Okay, Jeff, but that that whole line of thinking seems crazy. I mean, basically, the more that the Fed engaged in quantitative easing, it, it seems the more that economists, they look at not getting the results they expected from quantitative easing, you and I might conclude, okay, that means the QE was not as effective as they hoped. Maybe they should rethink their, their strategy and do something else instead of QE. Instead, it almost seems like what they're doing is they're reinterpreting their own previous miscalculation of economic potential, and they're drawing the line a different way that almost sort of kind of justifies the result they got from QE after the fact. It, it seems like they're rationalizing the results of QE rather than objectively interpreting them in order to decide whether or not their models are actually spitting out useful information. Yeah, Eric, it, it, to me, this is the defining feature of this entire debate. Remember, the question is whether the economy can't grow or is it being held back by something? So by doing multiple QEs that they thought solved all of these liquidity problems, officials were saying, well, it must be the economy that is broken because it can't be that QE didn't work. If QE didn't lead to an actual recovery, then according to economists, the economy has to be the problem because QE is awesome and it's, it's inarguably great. But that was always an assumption, and it was, and it was always one that was never supported by the evidence, not just in terms of falling bond yields, but an entire mountain of market prices and debt, all the things that we've talked about, you know, euro dollar futures, swap spreads, and on and on. All of these things that said monetary conditions were never normalized. They remained tight throughout the entire period. And every time the economy finally appeared ready to take off into a recovery, it was short-circuited by something. Every time it was short-circuited, we find all of these things like falling treasury yields during each one. It happened again in 2013 and 2014, as I'm showing you on slide 19. So the process was just repeated over and over and over. And rather than admit that the Fed didn't actually fix any problem with QE, uh, economists simply changed their economic potential models, which redefined the whole notion of the recovery, didn't it? Yeah, and, and that's the part they didn't tell you, especially the last couple of years. If you go to slides 20 through 22, the economy would start to recover, then it would be stopped. And rather than figure out how or why it, would, it, would, it could be stopped each time, they just shrugged their shoulders, threw up their hands and decided, hey, the economy must be a little more broken. And then just you know rinse and repeat. And then we get to the last couple of years. If you go to slide 23, official calculations of R star and potential had gotten so low 
that he, with even a modest, and I mean modest, acceleration in economic growth during 2017, it should have become hugely inflationary. If we take their much reduced calculation of potential seriously, then what it was, what it said was by the end of 2017 or early 2018 at the latest, all economic slack was finally gone. It had been completely exhausted. And it never happened. The whole R star story fell apart. And again, we, we talked about this. You know, the bond market said that the flattening yield curves were telling you this thing wasn't happening. That the, the the recovery, the end of slack, the inflationary outbreak, all of these things, they were not happening. Okay, so but you know, now with rate cuts and repo interventions, what did happen was that the official view of potential was changed yet again. Only this time, if you can go to slide 24, they raised their calculation of potential. That's what they did last year in, in August of 2019. What that means is because there wasn't an inflationary outbreak, the one that they kept hollering about, you know, they went hysterical over in, in late 2017, then we can only conclude, and even these R star calculations say, that there must be some level of economic slack still remaining in the economy. They're just moving the target, as you said, Eric, but now in the opposite direction so that reality conveniently fits in with their theory. Okay, Jeff, but that's a profound change, isn't it? Because what you're getting at seems to be that if the models say there's some slack, then it's entirely possible that there's actually in reality a whole lot of slack. That's a very different story than what the Fed is telling us. So could it be then, or if that's the case, then what is the something else? I mean, it seems like you, you keep alluding something else is holding the economy back that they don't seem to be acknowledging. What is that something? Well, that something is you know the global dollar short is a global dollar, the euro dollar system that we've been talking about. And in all of, we're talking about all this and the repo thing and everything else just in time for you know the bond market to yet again remind us, in, you know, if you go to slide 25, that's exactly what this thing is. It's monetary tightness, to put it, you know, oversimplistic view of it. Treasury yields are falling, you know, the repo market goes haywire, and the economy becomes uncertain all over again in the short terms. So even if it doesn't lead to outright recession in 2020, like it did not the two previous times, it still adds up to yet another false dawn, which gets piled on top of the two, that it, the two others that have previously happened. You know, if you go back in 2014, slide 26, while that second false dawn was unfolding, or what I call euro dollar number three, the third outbreak of a global dollar shortage, Janet Yellen was, was brought before the Senate to testify, and she was asked about it. Well, she said that, you know, it wasn't likely to happen again in 2014. She admitted that this this was possible. You know, slide 27. More than that, you know, what she admitted, what she was talking about was that in all likelihood, there was actually still some slack in the economy, but it was hidden slack. And so over the next couple of years, she grew more confident that it had been used up. But what we've seen from the economy in terms of inflation, treasury yields, all of those market indicators I've, I always talk about is that her private hunch has been proven correct. So let's go back one more time to Bernanke in 2003 on slide 28. Remember, he said you couldn't just look at the short-term interest rate to tell you where things stand, both in terms of monetary policy as well as the economy overall. Now, why was that? It's because the central bank cannot define money, and therefore it cannot measure it or use it, as, use it to guide their policies. In the absence of being able to do that, Officials have just assumed they could figure out how to conduct monetary policy using other means and other measures, things like our star. But what if they assumed wrong? The 2008 crisis was also a consequence of getting money monetary policy wrong, and it should have been a wake-up call for monetary officials to look at their capabilities differently and maybe rethink whether they know what they are doing. So in terms of the economy, we're back at our original question. If you go to slide 29 and slide 30. Is the economy broken so that it can no longer grow like it once did, the rate of change, the pre-crisis rate of change? Or is it being artificially held back by something that no one will ever talk about? Now, if we remember Milton Friedman, we don't have to guess. We don't have to depend upon reverse engineering something like our star. We've got the deepest, most sophisticated markets in the world to tell us what's wrong and what has remained wrong for over 12 years. So even though Real GDP is at a record high. That's technically true. It isn't anything like that in reality. The economic rate of change changed, and that's actually a huge problem. This isn't the longest expansion on record because it doesn't actually qualify as an expansion, unless, of course, you think our star is anywhere close to accurate, despite any evidence for it being that way, including the, the economists and the, the econometric models and their calculations of potential. So, in my view, where the, all the evidence leads us is that the economy isn't broken. 
the monetary system is, and so is central banking. And so in the final analysis, this latest repo flare-up is just one more, one more reminder of that on an already lengthy list of them. Okay, now it all finally comes together, Jeff, and makes sense. So to summarize, the problem, the real problem, which has been holding the economy back ever since the 2008 great financial crisis, has really been this euro-dollar system breakdown. And for any new listeners who are not familiar with Jeff's work, Jeff and I did a whole series called Euro-Dollar University. It's free at macrovoices.com forward slash edu for Euro-Dollar University. That series of podcasts describes how on August 9th of 2007, something changed and changed dramatically and has never been the same since and caused a breakdown in the commercial euro dollar system. That's what is the real thing that's holding back the economy and the Fed has misinterpreted it. They keep trying to solve the problem that they perceive to exist with more quantitative easing when in fact that's not really going to solve it. Is that a fair summarization, Jeff? Yeah. And, and you know, it's obviously a, a complex story, but simplifying things to the, its highest level, that's really what we've seen. And again, it's Milton Friedman's interest rate fallacy personified. Low interest rates, tight money. And what we're talking about with the euro dollar system and the breakdown of the euro dollar system is that it's been malfunctioning, not consistently, but intermittently, which causes a short circuit, not just in the monetary system, therefore tight money conditions, but it's holding the economy back from what should be a full recovery. You know, we should be able to go back to the rate of change. This idea that the economy is broken in the U.S. because of the labor market, you know, problems in the labor force, baby boomers or whatever, it's completely ridiculous, especially since we see this type of economic behavior, not just in the U.S. economy, but in Europe and all across Asia. It's, in, it's infecting the entire global economy, which – you know, obviously there's different local factors involved with those. So if we see economic rates of change changing all over the world, there has to be something singular that defines each one of those things. And that's the Euro, you know, global dollar system, global reserve currency, tight money conditions that, that affects the entire global economy and has for a dozen years. Well, Jeff, we're going to need to leave it there in the interest of time, but I look forward to getting you back in a month or so for another update where we can go a little bit deeper into everything that's going on in the global euro dollar system. This episode of Macro Voices All Stars was made possible by TopTradersUnplugged.com, the leading podcast on quant and rules based investing. Be sure to claim your free copy of their recently updated guide to the best investing books ever written at toptradersunplugged.com forward slash macro guide. And if you haven't heard it yet, be sure to check out my full-length interview with Niels Kastrup Larson on trend-following strategies, which is linked in your research roundup email. For the Macro Voices Podcast Network, I'm Eric Townsend. concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Please register your free account at macrovoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices.